Ohio State has just finished its spring game, and we got to talk about what we saw and what conclusions we can draw from this very, very cool experience on Fox. I'm RJ Young. This is the number one college football show podcast. And frankly, I've been looking forward to this spring game for some time because many of you know I am over the moon with what this roster looks like at Ohio State presently. It is the most talented roster that money can buy. And we can say that in an era where name, image, and likeness money has done so much to change the landscape of college football. And then you take into account what Ryan Day has spent on the coaching staff, or I should say the athletic department has spent on the coaching staff, in addition to his salary. But I want to get started with some game stuff where we get into the name, image, and likeness and salary stuff because the game was just played and I thought we could draw some really cool conclusions from it. Well, number one is Jeremiah Smith is box office. Really love watching that dude play in high school and you can see how four can really add to their offense a dynamic that they had in Marvin Harrison Jr., in Jackson Smith and Jigba. And when you talk about what he means for that program, all you really got to do is listen to the folks that work there and some of the luminaries that are around there. As a matter of fact, let's go through it. Mickey Marotti, who is the strength coach du jour, uh, extraordinaire, not du jour, at Ohio State, said he is the most impressive freshman that he has seen since Percy Harvin. Percy Harvin might be the best football player that Urban Meyer ever had. To that point, Urban said when he talked to Mark Pantone, who's the general manager, roster management, scouting, that sort of thing at Ohio State, that Pantone said, I don't really want to put this on a player because it feels like a lot of pressure, but he is the best first-year player that I've ever seen. And then you talk about what Urban has seen from Jeremiah Smith, and you're already hearing the kind of traits that Marvin Harrison Jr. had, which is he keeps his head down. He doesn't really seek out spotlight. He goes and he makes plays. And there have been social media clips all over of just what he is capable of doing in a room full of five stars. The five stars are saying that guy has to play. Carnell Tate saying he has to play. Omega Buka, who is leading that wide receiver room, he has to play. Brandon Ennis saying he has to play. I thought what Joel had to say about him looking like a fourth-year senior was also just tremendous. Because when you talk about a true freshman who looks the part coming straight in, you want to get him on the football field. And then you talk about what Brady Quinn had said for what this kid can mean for college football as a whole. And you talk about LeBron James, right? This is a lot that we're saying about Jeremiah Smith, but that's what it means when you are one of the top recruits in high school football that decides to go to a place like Ohio State. And then you can buckle the knees of your head coach just by signing on the dotted line. That We've all seen the clip of Ryan Day going to sign a day going, to, did, he, did he do it? Did he sign? Are you sure? Do we have it? And then the relief and the buckled knees that he was, that he was showing for us to get across just what this player could mean for their chances in 2024. It's difficult to think about what Jeremiah Smith can add that Marvin Harrison Jr. couldn't, but start with you can slot one in and slot one out, right? That's fun. And I think we're going to see more of that as we go through into the summer and into preseason. You're probably going to see a lot of Jeremiah Smith in addition to an outstanding backfield in Travion Henderson and Quinshawn Judkins. Chip Kelly's first play from scrimmage was out of the tee, handed the ball to Travion Henderson with Will Howard under center. You look at that offensive line, we wanted to see what that right-sided offensive line could do, but we didn't see a whole lot of, well, tackling in the first half of this game because they were playing with a thud technique. Now, I understand there's some people that wanted to see them tackle, because you'd always want to see them tackle. But thud just means we're not taking anybody to the ground. Why don't we want to take anybody to the ground? Because this is a very talented roster that they paid a lot of money for. And you don't get to hurt it in a spring game. Because that is the one thing that cannot happen if you are a coach in a spring game. You cannot have any serious injuries coming out of this thing. It is a glorified practice. And spring practices, you just want to get through them healthy on your way to the end of April, where you really got to work on this roster retention, but you also got to make sure that you're playing these guys enough for them to feel wanted and for their appetites to play to feel sated. That said, I was taking into account, like you, who we saw first and really drawing conclusions from there. So Will Howard comes out first as the starting quarterback 
even knowing that you got a guy like Julian Sam back there and Devin Brown, he's played a bunch of football for, or I say a bunch, a little bit of football for you. And Lincoln Keenholz, who played some football for you. Aaron Nolan coming in as a true freshman. But we didn't see much out of Will Howard. I didn't see anything particularly great. I didn't see anything particularly bad. But you could also see that he was really getting up to speed with the offense. And Chip Kelly is going to give his quarterbacks opportunities to make plays on the perimeter with their run skills, which is something that we wanted to see Ryan Day do a little bit more of, even knowing that his offense the last few years has been built around being able to run the ball effectively with gap scheme and then get these one-on-ones on the outside for these outstanding wide receivers. But adding this dynamic where you have to account for the quarterback on every single play is going to, I think, make them a much better offense than they were in 2023 that was really the unit that held them back as the defense was holding up its end I'm also looking at this and I'm asking Lincoln Keenholz coming in as the second string option here I don't know that that guy gets to keep this after today like in the first half he had a fumbled snap and he threw an interception now we could talk about the wind and how it is playing around there but Lincoln Keenholz didn't look particularly great in the Cotton Bowl against Missouri doesn't look like he is shaking that off but the guy that got more snaps than any of the other guys, not named Will Howard, was Julian Sand. Julian Sand out there, he reminds many folks of Bryce Young because he is lithe, right? And he is accurate and he's quick with the ball. I couldn't help looking at him thinking, man, Antoine Randall at Indiana is who you remind me of because he's so short and he's so small, but he's back there making plays, making it happen. He's also been moving the needle at practices since joining up as a true freshman. I could see him coming in as your number two. And given what Ryan Day has liked to do at that position, I'm going to be looking at that pay game that they play later this year where, you know, there's always going to be a team from the state of Ohio that comes to Ohio State that they play. Usually, we see the second string quarterback take those snaps. We've seen Ryan Day do this because he came into a predicament when he had C.J. Stroud and Jack Miller contending for a starting job, and he hadn't really got to see either one of those guys throw the ball live. The next year, he came out with Kyle McCord against Akron. He had a really great game, backing up C.J. Stroud. And I think we're going to see more of that, right? I think that's what we're going to see the maturation of the process here because, A, we're going to a 12-team playoff, and, B, you're going to play more games, and you want to get as many guys opportunities to play as you can so that they feel like they got a chance to contribute and they don't feel like they are just on the bench sitting there waiting their turn. I get that that is upsetting to some because that's what college football has been. But there are no guarantees in the age of the transfer portal and name, image, and likeness. That said, having guys that are returning to your team has proven to be a tremendous benefit in college football. Not in the same way that we thought you could go and put together a brand new roster and go win. Though I think it's more like both of these systems are going to work. Texas Christian did this in 2022. They go five and seven. Sonny Dykes goes in the portal, reshapes a bunch of the offense and the defense, and they end up in the national championship game. Meanwhile, a team like Michigan last year runs the table, goes undefeated primarily because of roster retention. They're able to keep a bunch of guys who understand their roles, understand the offenses. You have coaches that are still on staff, so you have continuity on that as well. Just finishing a conversation about this offense, we didn't see it operating at the level that I expect to see it by the time that we get to week one. But I think given Chip Kelly, the play calling privileges is going to help Ryan Day at the other parts of his job, which are making sure that he knows what he knows from his players, giving his assistants the support that they need, and also just adding a new dynamic and a new voice in that room between the two of them, I expect to see some really cool play calls and, and for them to be able to move the football, not unlike we've been used to seeing Oregon use uh, move the football when Chip Kelly was head coach and Ryan Day move the football when he was offensive coordinator. It's great to see James People gives a little bit of run. It's great to see snaps Seth McLaughlin out there also running that offensive line. All right. I want to talk a little bit about the defense and just how – improved it could be because it was great last year right USTD allowed last year really the best defense for me in the Big Ten outside of Michigan and really a top 10 defense and they could be better this year precisely because they returned so many guys on that side of that ball that had played a lot of football 
for Jim Knowles, right? Year three for Jack Sawyer and JT Tui Molau, who could be first round draft picks in 2025. David Igbunison is also back at corner, right? Think about Jordan Hancock. Think about Denzel Burke. Lathan Ranson didn't play because he's still recovering from a Liz Frank uh, injury, but that's a safety that can help you. And that's before we start talking about Caleb Downs, who is the most prized transfer portal get for anybody in this cycle. We're number one out there. I expect to see him in all spots. I expect to see him on the line of scrimmage. I expect to see him in a, in a linebacker at the wheel side. I expect to see him playing free safety. I expect him to see him uh, playing strong safety. In this 4-2-5, you can really put him wherever you want. He led freshmen in tackles last year as a safety at Alabama, 107. I thought he was the best defensive back in the country last year, and that's the guy that I had at the top of my list of Thorpe Award uh, finalists as far as I was concerned. It was him. It was Billy Bowman at Oklahoma, and it was Xavier Watts at Notre Dame. I think he can really help you on that defensive side because he's just going to be a pterodactyl back there, right? He's going to be able to cover sideline to sideline. He's going to be able to close and help you in the run game. He's going to be a tremendous asset to what Jim Knowles already knows how to do, which is put his players in positions to go make plays and really take advantage of this team's speed. They don't have to blitz as often as some others because they can get home with four, but also because they got enough closing speed at the, in the secondary and at the linebacker positions to really be able to sit back and react as, to be, as opposed to be proactive and have to dictate to the offense what they're going to be. That gives you a lot of room to be multiple as you're going to see these different offenses throughout the Big Ten in this year where we add Washington, Oregon, UCLA, USC, right? You're going to see a bunch of this. You're going to see power run game from Michigan. You're going to see them air it out if you are USC and you got to have a defense that can adapt to all of those things. All right. I want to talk about how we got to the space where we get to talk about an offense and a defense, an Ohio State program that features Caleb Downs at safety, Will Howard, Julian Sand, Aaron Nolan uh, at quarterback, Travion Henderson, and Quinshawn Jenkins at running back, Carnell Tate, Brandon Ennis, Jeremiah Smith, the Mecca Buka at wide receiver, right? Sonny Styles still playing linebacker and safety over there at Ohio State on the defensive side. I, I got to say, if the transfer portal did not exist, we wouldn't see it. But more than that, if name, image, and likeness did not exist, we would see that. As I said at the top here, it's the best team that money can buy. Because check it. This is in The Athletic, and this was uh, Stuart Mandel, and I thought this was great, getting this quote from Ryan Day. At Ohio State, you got to beat the team up north and win every other game. If that's the expectation every year, you're, you like your chances a lot more when you have good players. So we might as well get the best meaning that they can go spend money that their two major NIL collectives raised for them on these players to keep them there. And when you were listening to Jenny Taft and Joel Klatt talk to these players on the sidelines and why they were choosing to come back, one of the things that they said was, hey, look, we wanted to go finish something. We want to be that team that gets us back on the good foot. Remember, they have lost three consecutive games to Michigan over the last three years, and they've watched that power pendulum swing to Michigan over the last three years. And then adding this, I thought a really great quote from Donovan Jackson where he was saying, look, I could have gone anywhere else. I know a lot of the players that I uh, have played with could go anywhere else, but we didn't want to do that. What we wanted to do was stay here and name, image, and likeness means we're wanted. Means they want us to be on this roster. Means our experience matters as much as our talent. And I think you're doing everything you can if you're Ryan Day to keep that roster retention. Remember, the transfer portal opens on April 16th. So being able to play your spring game before that transfer portal opens, I think also gives you an opportunity to continue to have conversations with your players as they are heading into the end of the spring semester and you want them around for what's going to be, you think, a magic year at Ohio State. It is all about getting to November 30th undefeated and winning that game. That is what Ryan Day is about. He understands the urgency for him to win this year and he has bet so much on this team and on that staff and that is also reflected in the salary pool for the Ohio State coaching staff remember Chip Kelly's making two million dollars to call plays because he didn't want to be a head coach anymore he just wanted to coach ball they went and got running backs coach Carlos Lachlan from Oregon just a couple weeks ago and he's making less money at six hundred fifty thousand dollars than Tony Offer was making he's making seven hundred seventy two thousand dollars before he decided 
to go to Michigan. Safeties coach Matt Gieri, who is a disciple and really a great pupil of Jim Knowles, he's going to make 425. Linebackers coach in Ohio State, great. James Laurinaitis, he's going to make 325. The Ohio State assistant coaching staff is the highest paid in the country by a margin. They're paying that staff $11.425 million. That is $1.3 million more than the University of Georgia is paying its assistant coaches, $2 million more than the University of Alabama is paying its assistant coaches, and $2 million more than Ohio State paid its 2023 coaching staff. And that is on top of Ryan Day is scheduled to make $10 million to be head coach for the Buckeyes this year. Yes, it's a lot of money. Yes, it's more money than anybody else is spending. It also means that they want to win at Ohio State. I understand that there are some folks that want to say you're going out to buy this team, you're going out to buy these coaches, but that's what the sport is. It's always been about capitalism. This has always been one of the biggest programs in the country, and that is reflected, quite frankly, in the attendance for this spring game. You get 50,000 people to show up for a spring game free or otherwise, You've done a really good job, and people expect you to be good in the coming year. Ohio State had more than 80,000 people show up for their spring games, and they're selling tickets at 10 bucks a head. Okay? That is how much this team means at, in Columbus, and frankly, that is the urgency that is being felt. Everybody understands what this team needs to accomplish, not, not just what it can accomplish, but what it needs to accomplish this year, as it is perhaps the most talented roster that we have seen at Ohio State since 2014, that national championship year. And I don't think that that's saying too much. Matter of fact, Urban Meyer said as much. He said, look, this is one of the most talented programs that we've seen over the last half decade, and it is the most talented roster in all of football. It's really fun to see this team working out together. It's really fun to see this team go good on good at the start in the first half. But again, get through the portal and let's see if you can still retain what you have because that's the only question left for Ohio State before we go into the summer break and really start to gear up for what is going to be an exciting 2024 season. Can you keep all of these guys on the roster for the next 18 days, right? Portal opens on the 16th. I believe it closes um, not long afterwards, but we're also in this transition period where I think this is probably going to be the last time that we have a spring portal, uh, meaning if we go back to January and Nick Saban doesn't uh, decide to retire before the portal closes, right, perhaps Alabama's in a better position, right? Having these two entry points when you have one in December and one in April is just a little too much. Uh, we've already moved the dates so that they don't conflict with signing day and they don't conflict with what I hope would be an outstanding bowl season as we're going to play at least one more game to decide a national champion 16. So get through this period of the transfer portal and then see what you got. And if you got what I think you're going to have, which is this roster, gear up for what should be an outstanding year if you are an Ohio State Buckeye. All right. That is going to do it for this instant reaction episode of the number one college football podcast. And you know what? We will see y'all live on Tuesday talking all things college football once again. Thanks so much for your time. Deuces. If you like what you've seen, consider subscribing to the number one college football show on YouTube, the Fox Sports app, or wherever you get your podcast.